So hey, I'm Dan McKinley. Uh, I'm a general purpose web programmer guy. Uh, I got my start in the financial industry uh, over a decade ago. I worked there for a while, and then I freaked out and moved to Brooklyn and worked at this startup called Etsy in 2007. Um, so this, the entirety of this talk is about my time at Etsy. I don't work there anymore, but I had a great time there, and I learned a lot. And I'm not done talking about it. I'll tell you just a little bit about what Etsy is. It's a marketplace for handmade and vintage goods. Um, it sold well over a billion dollars of stuff in 2013, probably more this year. Uh, so Etsy's really big. Uh, but when I got my start there, it was really small. It was less than 20 people when I started. And that journey from point A to point B was a really wild ride. Um, it, there was a lot of arguing about a lot of stuff. There were three CEO changes while I was there. The thing we argued about the most was this, what do we spend our time on? Uh, so at all points, what we told ourselves about that was this, we should try to be data-driven. Now, uh, somebody had heard that Google was data-driven, we really wanted to be like Google, and so we said, okay, we're gonna be data-driven too. And there was one problem with that, which is that nobody had any idea what that meant or what that would imply. So, uh, what you would get all the time was something like this. Somebody would have a project that they wanted to get scheduled, and they would sprinkle some numbers on it and call it data-driven. It was like this weird display behavior. But over time, I did start to figure out what it would mean to actually choose what we work on using data. Uh, and I also realized that it was not that difficult, and that's what the rest of this talk is about. So I want to talk you through how I figured all that stuff out, and that starts back in 2007. Um, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea here and think that I'm talking smack about Etsy in its early days. I'm definitely not. It was a magical place. It was awesome, and I miss 2007 all the time. But I also think it's really important to be honest about it. And the truth of the matter is that Etsy didn't grow geometrically because of the carefully planned and executed activities of its employees. It grew geometrically because it was like striking oil. Um, Etsy was this thing that was out there waiting for somebody to discover it. Um, but just as human beings, we're not really hardwired to see things that way. We tend to think that if you do something and it's a big success, then the things that you did before it was successful must have caused that success. That's just human nature, and we took that into the product as well. We thought, well, we built this thing, and people really love it, and so that's just a repeatable process, and we didn't really question ourselves too much. We thought, well, if you build it, they will come. Um, and the crazy thing about that is that if growth is really this big externality, then no matter what you do, it looks like it's working. As long as you don't completely destroy the core functionality of the site, you can do literally anything you want, and all the graphs go up and to the right. And that was the situation we found ourselves in, and it was great, but uh, it's only great as long as you don't think about it too hard. And so, of course, we ruined all of it by going and thinking about it too hard. I was there long enough to notice that we went through this cycle uh, over and over again. So we would release a product, we would have an all-hands meeting where we'd say, hey, we released this thing, and everybody would applaud and scream and be happy about it, and then you wouldn't hear much about it for a while, and then two years later, we'd turn it off because nobody ever used it. We did that over and over again. A good example of that is this product called Alchemy. The general idea there was that you could come to Etsy, describe an item that you wanted to buy, and then Etsy sellers could bid on making it for you. And that is a really cool idea. It got written up in the New York Times a couple of times. Um, it was generally perceived to be great, but by 2011, we just turned it off. And in its entire three-year lifetime, Alchemy sold fewer items, than, uh, fewer items than the Etsy, the rest of the site, sells over the course of a day. So it was a huge bust, and around this time, I had had enough of this, and I thought, I was very selfishly, hey, is there any way I personally could avoid participating in projects like this? Because I have this weird thing about me where I don't like to just completely waste my time doing things like that. Around the same time, we started A-B testing stuff, uh, and I kind of latched onto that as a solution, maybe. Uh, so the idea there would be, instead of just pushing something out to all of traffic and then praying, what we would do instead would be push something out and only give it to half of people and then make some sort of objective measurement about whether or not they were behaving the way we wanted them to. Um, and the thing we discovered almost immediately upon doing that is, oh my God, we're nowhere near as good at our jobs as we thought that we were. 
Uh, what happened most of the time was that we would push a project, put, push something out, uh, A-B test it, and nothing would happen. It was just crickets. There would be no, no reaction whatsoever. No metrics would move. Uh, what happened occasionally would be that things got worse, usually only slightly worse, but nevertheless worse. Um, and the thing that never happened was that we would release something, and then there would be this major improvement in any metrics that we cared about. The problem at the time, I think, was that we were still picking products based on what sounds the best, but a critical thing had changed. Uh, my slide screwed up. A critical thing had changed, but, uh, it, and that was that we had added this objective measurement of uh, how well we were doing. And so I think at that point, it would have been uh, a popular decision to stop measuring, but that, <laughs> that would have been very disingenuous, right? We'd opened up Pandora's box by seeing how good we were doing, and we couldn't just like close it again and say, uh, well, the hell with it. Uh, but over time, like, we did figure out ways to improve our batting average, and I'm going to talk through that now. So to recap, in the very beginning, we'd come up with an idea, spend a ton of time building it, and then we'd push it out. A little later, we added this A-B testing step to it, um, although most of the time, the A-B testing step took a lot longer than we intended it to take because we weren't getting the results we wanted to get. Sometimes we never got the result that we wanted to get, and we would just have to throw out everything we were doing. And that sucked. That hurt a lot. Uh, but by about 2012, we settled into a process that looked a lot more like this. And it's a little more complicated, but there are good reasons for it. The core idea there is that instead of just like coming up with an idea and then off to the races, go build it, you use data to try and figure out uh, first, if you can, how good of an idea it is. Another critical part of it is that you don't overinvest in the building step because experience tells us most things don't work out the way you initially conceive them. You A-B test a minimal version of it first, and then you go back later, you refine it, and then you do subsequent A-B tests to get to some point where you are comfortable releasing something to all traffic. A uh, great thing about this process is that it gives you at least two places early on where you can just give up. Uh, those are much cheaper than doing it at the very end. You still ret retain the option of giving up at the very end of the process, but you don't have to exercise it that often if you give yourself more chances. Uh, so rather than just leave you with that abstraction, I'm going to go through two uh, examples. Uh, these are both products that we at least talked about building at Etsy um, at some point, and I think that the notable thing about these is that neither of them sounds completely crazy the first time you hear it, hear it uh, said. So the first one is, let's build a landing page for local furniture. So that slide is screwed up again. Uh, anyway, the, the uh, idea here is Etsy has these landing pages for uh, all of its categories. Uh, it has one for furniture, too. The thing that's notable about furniture is furniture is really heavy, and that makes it really hard to sell on the internet. Uh, so uh, the idea here would be let's only show people furniture that's close to them geographically, and then maybe they'll buy more of it. That sounds like a reasonable idea. The first thing I would do there would be to say, OK, who's going to see this thing? In this case, it turns out a lot of people would see it. So the pages we're talking about changing aren't the most important pages on Etsy by any means, but they're in the top five, which in the context of Etsy is a whole lot of traffic. Obviously, not all of that's um, for furniture, but a good bit of it is for furniture. So, so far, so good. Now, uh, if you dig a little bit deeper, what you find is that, unfortunately, not very many people buy items that they find on these pages. If you compare it to a page like Search, Search has a ton of traffic, and many, many people find products that they wind up buying using Search, but not very many people find products they wind up buying using these pages. Um, so that makes this look a little bit worse. Now, um, hold on a minute, though. Uh, furniture, like I said, is very heavy. It's also very expensive. So maybe, although we're not going to sell many more pieces of furniture, the ones we do sell will be worth a lot. So maybe it may still make sense to do this, we'll make it up that way. So if you imagine that the average item on Etsy is worth about $40, and it's not, like I have to fake a bunch of financial numbers here. It's not $40, but let's imagine that it is. Let's say that the average item of furniture that we're going to sell will be 10 times that. It's going to be $400. And so from here, we have enough inputs where we can start to reason about what it would mean to, for us to improve the state of the world by changing this page. Uh, that's an equation that looks like this. We have a certain number of visits to, the, to these pages. They convert into purchases at some rate. The 
each one of those purchases is worth some amount, and then we're going to improve that by some percentage. I talked through how we estimate the first three terms there, and now we're going to see what different values for how much we're going to change things would affect uh, the world. So that's what this looks like. Over the course of a year, uh, this, would, this is what it would mean to improve purchasing behavior by half a percent through 2%. I chose those percentages um, based mostly on past experience with doing A-B tests on these kinds of pages. Usually, you don't affect people's behavior all that much. I think that a uh, change in of 2% would be really hitting it out of the park. But let's say that we really do hit it out of the park and we, change pe we make people 2% more likely to buy. What that would mean would be that Etsy would sell $360,000 more stuff, more furniture, over the course of a year. Uh, a critical piece of context there, though, is that Etsy is a marketplace, so most of the value goes to the people selling the items of furniture. Etsy only keeps 3.5% of the sale price, so that's $13,000. Now, if you imagine that a, uh, two developers, a product manager, a designer, all of their HR overhead, all of their managerial overhead, their health insurance, and all of that is devoted to this for a month or two, then this makes this not look very attractive. You can realize that, oh, it's, it's going to take Etsy a very long time to earn back the, what they invest in this if we do this. And so I would say at this point, let's go work on something else. Whereas in the past, what we would have done would, would have been we would have stopped that idea and said, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Uh, go, go build that. Um, second idea I'm going to go through is emailing people that give up in the middle of purchases. So Etsy, like every e-commerce site that exists, has this shopping cart. You add stuff to your cart. You fill out your shipping information. You fill out your credit card information, and then you check out. Uh, and people can and do give up at every step along the way. So the idea here would be, for the people who give up along the way, let's wait like five days, send them an email and say, hey, did you really intend to buy that thing because you didn't? Maybe you just closed the, the tab accidentally. It happens, uh, something like that. And so modeling that looks like this. We have a certain number of users per day who are eligible for that email. They have some average value of stuff in their cart. And we're going to be successful by some percentage at getting them to come back and finish buying. Uh, so if we model that in the same way, it looks like this. Uh, it, I chose percentages of our success rate at being between 1% and 5%. I think that a higher guess is reasonable in this case because these are much more engaged users. Uh, first of all, we know their email address. And then second of all, they're halfway down the checkout funnel already. So I think that we could postulate that we're going to be slightly more successful at getting them to come back and buy. Uh, but let's be conservative here and say, well, we're only going to get 1% more of them to come back and buy with this. What would that mean? In this case, what that would mean is that Etsy would sell $3 million more stuff, or Etsy would keep $100,000 more. And so that looks a lot more attractive. And I would say, this is a good example of a product that we should go ahead and build. And I actually did build that one while I was at Etsy. And it wound up being, uh, by the time I left anyway, between a half percent and 1% of all of Etsy's sales, which may not sound extremely impressive, but I assure you that that's epic. And so <laughs> I, I, uh, I hope that you can see that with just uh, applying the most the stupidest possible math to the situation, we can make one idea look really bad and make one idea look really good when the first time you hear them, they both sound like pretty good ideas. So if I can generalize for just a minute, the, the metaphor that I have in my head when I'm doing this kind of work, not to be excessively grandiose or anything, is Archimedes with his lever. Archimedes uh, famously said, give me a place to stand and I can move the entire earth. Uh, and so what you're doing when you're going through a big set of ideas and trying to apply data to them to see if they're good or not is you're searching the solution space for a place where you can stand to apply your effort to actually make a difference. The questions that you should be asking yourself when you're doing this is, how many people do I have? What are they like? Um, a th uh, important thing to note is that it's only, I think it's only important to be correct within an order of magnitude. That's great. Um, I think that what you'll find is if you just rely on hunches, if you uh, don't do any of this work, you're not even going to be correct within an order of magnitude. So close is, close is good enough. I think that it's still legitimate to do products just because they sound cool sometimes. But the key word there is sometimes. And I think how often may depend on where you are. If you're a startup, you're not going to have a lot of data to be able to do like fine-grained analysis like this. 
Um, you may be able, you may have some data, you may have other people's data, you can still draw a box around products, and maybe your error mar margin of error is just going to be a lot bigger. Uh, other things you can do as a startup would be to work on tools to make doing this easier as you go along and accumulate data. You can work on accumulating the data. Um, and then again, if you're a very mature company, you're not, you, you ha will have lots of data and mature tools and a budget to do this for everything if you want, but I still think it's legitimate to occasionally just uh, take a shot at the moon once in a while. Um, so I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. So I started uh, this, I started in this journey trying to come up with a reasonable answer to what we should build and to win these arguments. And I think the conclusion that I came to is that if somebody walks up to you and says, I know what we should build, and they can't show you any of this work, you should run away from that person as fast as possible. I think that um, a lot of ideas sound really good, but I think that sounding awesome is not a remarkable feature of a product idea. I think it's completely natural if you are like me, an employee at a startup, to think, oh, the CEO is doing this. Oh, my boss is doing this. In other situations, you might think, oh, my employees are doing this for me. But in my experience, nobody's doing this. Nobody does this at all. Like, you should ask. <laughs> you, should, you, should, um, you should do it yourself. You should build tools so that everybody can do it. Uh, getting access to data is kind of a tricky problem, but actually doing this analysis is easy. I've met tons of people in my life who just say things like, they just want to build cool things or whatever. And like, I was like that too. I just want to build cool things, but I think that having an impact um, really having an impact is a really cool thing. So thanks.